Lives of the Unconscious. A podcast on psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. Episode 22. C.G. Jung and the Collective Unconscious. In this episode, we want to look at a psychoanalytic school that has played a very controversial role in the history of psychoanalysis. Analytic psychology, according to Carl Gustav Jung. As controversial as Jung's person and teachings have been, at the same time, there is no question that he has been extraordinarily influential. Not only in psychoanalysis, one need only think of widely known concepts such as archetype, complex, collective unconscious, up to therapeutic approaches, such as active imagination. The school of C.G. Jung continues to exist to this day and is taught and further developed scientifically at various educational institutes, usually in productive exchange with other therapeutic schools. In this episode, we want to concentrate above all on carving out the creative value of Jungian thought for he gives priority to a level of psychological experience that doesn't have it easy in a society that is seemingly rational to the core, the symbolic world of the soul and all its expressions, fantasies, dreams, fairy tales, myths, all the way to art and the creations of religion. Today it is perhaps more important than ever to recall the significance of this world of symbols. After all, for the longest period of human history, it not only made up the content of entertainment and leisure, but stood at the very center of life. The decline in significance of this image world, this disenchantment of life, is from Jung's perspective not only welcome progress towards a rational and enlightened way of thinking, but a loss that makes mental life incomplete. But more on that later. The Jungian school's marginal position in psychoanalysis is in part a matter of its content and in part historical. Although Freud originally designated Jung the heir to the throne, who was, after all, the first chairman of the International Psychoanalytic Association, founded in 1910, he soon turned away from Freud's teachings. From then on, Freud and Jung were bound together by a kind of ongoing father-son feud sometimes carried on almost obsessively by Jung in particular. Although in terms of content, the two schools are by no means completely irreconcilable. The break with Freud plunged Jung into a deep personal crisis that led him into states of near psychosis. From those states, as well as from his work with schizophrenic patients and from ethnological journeys to North America, Africa, and India, he drew the material for a scientific and therapeutic work. Jung's role during National Socialism in Europe is a dark, or at least very shady, chapter. As a Swiss citizen, he was removed from direct control by the Nazis, yet did not use his independence to take a clear stand against National Socialist barbarism. Rather, his behavior was opportunistic to approving, at least in the early years of the regime. This, while many Jewish psychoanalysts were being persecuted and Freud's works were being burnt in front of German universities with the words, against the soul-ravaging glorification of the instinctual drives. At the same time, Jung himself was not a hater of Jews, but supported Jewish colleagues in emigration, and later distanced himself from the National Socialist regime, without, mind you, taking a deeper look at his own statements, which, however, later representatives of analytic psychology certainly did do. Jung's role during the period of fascism can certainly be interpreted as a personal failure and as a kind of opportunism, while at the same time, there are also links in terms of content, a fascist temptation in Jung's thinking, as it were, in which an old conflict between myth and enlightenment, romanticism and rationalism, is expressed but we will come back to this later. Now, what distinguishes Jungian psychoanalysis? 
This is certainly a question for more than one episode, and here we can only sketch some basic features. We want to discuss three aspects, which at the same time will make the contrast to classical Freudian psychoanalysis recognizable. The meaning of sexuality, the meaning of collective experience, and the relation to the unconscious and the irrational. Number one, the meaning of sexuality. One of the central contrasts to the classical paradigm of Freudian psychoanalysis is the role that sexuality is granted in psychological development. That is, the question of what ultimately drives us, motivates us in our actions, relationships, and development. Both Freud and Jung speak of libido as the central psychic force, but they mean something different. Freud, though by no means consistent and uniform in his work, ascribed psychic drives and energies, psychic development, and human relationships ultimately to sexual drives, whereby sexuality here means something different than what is understood by it in everyday life. Jung, on the other hand, saw a comprehensive force at work at the core of psychic activity. Libido, which cannot be reduced to sexual drives, denotes instead a kind of universal will. The Freudian conception is more oriented to biology and psychophysics. The Jungian conception to Far East ideas such as the Taoist Qi. In this way, a broader, sometimes spiritual understanding of the mental is introduced into psychoanalysis, admittedly, thereby also removing the sting of psychosexuality somewhat. The fact that it was Jung, not Freud, who had several affairs in his life, among others with his patient Sabine Spielrein, is an irony that we do not want to leave unmentioned here, even though at that time the abstinence rule in psychotherapy had not been so clearly formulated yet. Number two, the significance of the collective unconscious. According to the Jungian conception, our individual psychological life sits atop a mountain of collective experiences and images that we have acquired from our ancestors and that we carry with us unconsciously. According to Jung, the psychological home has three floors. The utmost floor is the conscious, i.e. those perceptions, thoughts, and memories that are conscious, or at least capable of becoming conscious. Underneath is the personal unconscious, i.e. those experiences which we have had over the course of our lives, but which are repressed, or, for other reasons, not accessible to the conscious mind. This is the level on which Freudian psychoanalytic work is situated, as in, when we deal with our own biography, our relationship to our parents, etc. According to Jung, both the conscious and the personal unconscious are born by the so-called collective unconscious. That is, the instantiation of experiences that reach back into human history far beyond our own lifespan. It is something like a psychological DNA, out of which our mental life is composed, whereby, according to Jung, this is meant quite literally, as he understood the collective unconscious as a part of our biological genetic material. More modern approaches, however, tend to focus on processes of social transmission. An event in one's own life story thus not only touches on one's own experience, but invariably also on collective experience. For example, when a woman becomes pregnant and has a child, the birth of the child, the fact of her becoming a mother, establishes a conscious as well as unconscious connection with her own mother, with the experiences she had in her own childhood, which can sometimes be a very painful encounter, as often happens in the course of postpartum depression. At the same time, the experience of birth and motherhood also touches on collective images of motherhood, deeply rooted in the woman's psychological life, and can best be described in mythical motifs, the mother as life-giving, nourishing, but at the same time, also as that which delivers death, as something dark, devouring, an ambivalence that, as the light motif of the maternal, finds various elaborations in myths and religions. 
Think, for example, of the Greek myth of Persephone, but also of the Christian Mary, who brings Jesus into being and, the piata motif, into the grave. The word matter comes from mater, Latin for mother. From the earth we are made, into the earth we will return. A woman who becomes a mother, as well as her partner, encounter these collective images of motherhood in their mental experience. Birth, unconsciously, also becomes an encounter with death, with growth and impermanence, and finally, bonding and separation. Postpartum means after the separation. The proto-images of motherhood appear to the expectant mother in her dreams, fantasies, emotional life, or fears, and are signs of a mental conflict, as when she dreams of a dense, dark, devouring forest in which she becomes lost and cannot find her way out. According to Jung, these images are derived from the so-called archetypes, primeval psychological structures that preform the experience of every human being. In the previous example, one would speak of a mother archetype, whereby the archetype itself is not visible, expresses itself only indirectly, for example, in images and dreams. For the mother-to-be, the encounter with the mother archetype is important in order to integrate the various aspects of motherhood and to establish a connection between her own experience and that which has been carried down to her. On the other hand, a so-called mother complex denotes a disposition in favor of only one aspect of motherhood, be that when the experience of motherhood is disavowed completely, or be that when motherhood devours all other aspects of the woman's identity and femininity. According to Jung, mental development strives for completeness, to become a whole, to integrate the different parts of the self, which he describes with the term individuation. That which appears to us in dreams and fantasies is most often the very part we are missing or rejecting. Dreams compensate for our waking life, try to establish wholeness, thereby alluding like a photo negative to what is missing. In addition to the mother archetype, there are others that appear in typical motifs and images, so typical that certain light motifs are repeated over and over in myths of various cultures. The myth researcher Joseph Campbell examined these proto-images and light motifs in his study, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and worked out a representative narrative structure that ranges from ancient myths, religious narratives from around the world, up to modern stories such as Star Wars, Harry Potter, or The Lord of the Rings. These are, from a Jungian perspective, stories about us, the hero's journey, as an epic of individuation, and have much to do with our mental life. A theater of the soul, so to speak, with different protagonists, each embodying an archetypal aspect of the self. For example, the child, as the symbol of the desire for development, often in the guise of an orphan, Frodo Baggins, Harry Potter. The integrated, mature self-consciousness, ruler, Son, Queen and King, Aragon's Way, King Arthur, or the mature Skywalker. The father archetype, sometimes assertive, sometimes referring primarily to the cognitive. The old sage, mentor, Gandalf, Dumbledore, Master Yoda. The shadow, the unlived, disavowed aspect of ourself, which we must eventually confront the dark doppelganger, the evil adversary, Sauron, Voldemort, Darth Vader. But the shadow does not only designate in us the evil, envy, aggression, and greed we have disavowed, but also the unfulfilled and the unredeemed. Also those missed opportunities in life, that which has been lost, that which can accompany us like a shadow through our life story, and which can turn into a persecutor, our unborn child, the life path we lacked the courage to explore, etc. Animus and Anima 
the feminine and masculine aspects of the self, on various levels from a raw, animalistic, greedy sexuality to a form that is spiritual and desexualized. From the orcs to the elves, the beauty and the beast, the frog and the prince. The trickster, the shape-shifting self, the mediator between worlds, cunning, the survival artist, player between good and evil, that which ultimately drives development, and perhaps the most human of all characters, Gollum. These stories are about how these characters enter into relationships and are transformed. In the so-called hero's journey, a typical and reoccurring narrative development, the hero undergoes various stages of individuation before, with a mature ego, returning to the everyday world as a more developed self. The hero's journey is, incidentally, also a therapeutic procedure used frequently in coaching sessions today. On the basis of his theories, Jung developed a complex and multi-layered personality psychology, which we will deal with another time. Number three, the relationship to the irrational. Here we come to perhaps the central trait of Jungian thought that has led to controversial disagreements over and again. It concerns his stance towards the irrational, whereby this term is not meant pejoratively, but rather describes phenomena and ideas that lie beyond the materialistic worldview of the natural sciences, from alchemy to astrology, but also the cosmos of religious ideas and forms of spirituality. Freud, on the other hand, is ultimately linked to the Occidental understanding of science, even if his work is by no means so clear and unified. The aim of psychoanalysis is to make the unconscious conscious, that means, to bring into one's own inner life the light of enlightenment, according to the well-known dictum, where the id is, the ego should be. Although this is a somewhat schematic account that is not quite applicable to Freudian and still less to contemporary forms of psychoanalysis. Yet still, this involves a tendency to break down psychological phenomena into rationally explainable causes that can be traced back to material foundations, be that one's own life history or certain processes in the brain. This view becomes clearest when Freud speaks of the psychic apparatus, in which certain quanta of energy are shifted back and forth. In a rationalistic understanding, astrology, superstition, but also religion and spirituality, are ultimately no more than a kind of psychological symptom. Although, this does not mean that they do not have important functions or express truths. Albeit, truths that become fully coherent only from the rational standpoint of science. Religious enthusiasts or daydreaming artists may grasp certain occurrences intuitively, but the scientist is ultimately the one who translates them into rational thought, and thus into the most advanced form of understanding. Jung, by contrast, ascribes to these phenomena, to the irrational, their own intrinsic right, there is something about them that cannot be translated into rational science. In their highest forms, things like astrology, alchemy, or religious topics come even closer to reality than the models of science, namely to the reality of the soul, for, as archetypal images, they are manifestations of the life of the soul. According to this understanding, the world of the psyche is not to be explained entirely in terms of external, material reality. An elemental spirit is not an erroneous conjunction to make sense of the world, or a false scientific theory about external reality, so to speak, but rather an image of the soul in which something is expressed that cannot be described with the language of science. Alchemy has little validity in terms of scientific chemistry. As a chemistry of mental states, however, it has quite a lot, which is why Jung devoted himself to it extensively. According to Jung, contained within the symbolic world of the soul is something that cannot be put into words, and that will be lost if it is resolved by rational explanation. He called it the numinous, 
following the psychology of religion at the time. That is, something ineffable, divine, and ultimately incomprehensible. In contrast to a mere sign, for example, a red traffic light means stop, archetypal symbols contain something that cannot be expressed in any other way but in that very symbol. They carry something numinous. Starting with the meditative meaning of ancient symbols, such as the circle, cross, sun image, or mandalas, up to the motifs of myths and religions. One need only think of the ancient Greek myth of Persephone. Hades, god of the underworld, falls in love with the young girl Persephone and takes her with him into the underworld, whereupon her mother Demeter, goddess of fertility, is so sad and distraught that she does not allow plants to grow and as a result people starve. Zeus, father of all gods, thus offers a compromise. Persephone is to spend half a year on earth and the other half in the underworld. One would be tempted to assume that the myth is an attempt by underdeveloped scientific reasoning to explain the reoccurring seasons. According to Jung, however, this would be a misguided or at least strongly abbreviated interpretation. In the myth of Persephone, something of the mystery of impermanence and return, birth and death is expressed and symbolically condensed. Something that is more than the mechanics of the rotation of the earth and the positions of the sun that becomes palpable to us when we step into nature with a meditative bearing and that can perhaps be grasped more with poetry or the nonverbal art of music than with a mathematical equation. In this irresolvability lies the magic of myths. When a fairy tale, a myth, or a story touches us, then it is because the incomprehensible within us has been touched. These stories are not merely fantasy, but speak to a spiritual reality that a psychological lab experiment could never come into contact with. This is why even the lousy ending of a popular television series can sometimes arouse greater affects and emotional pain than events in real life that appear to be much more significant. Understanding the symbolic world of the psyche as a reality of its own and granting to it its own form of thought is at the same time the point at which it connects to modern psychoanalytic schools for example, to the dream psychology of Wilfred Bion, which we will hear about in a separate episode. With Jung, however, psychoanalysis borders on religious experience and even more worrying on occultism. Herein lies what in Jung's teachings is so fascinating, but at the same time also so dangerous. For fascination and fascism can sometimes be precariously close and not only etymologically. This concerns the old conflict between rationalism and myth, between enlightenment and romanticism, although Jungian psychology, just like Freudian psychology, cannot be classified so definitively. The Jungian therapeutic approach consists in finding access to the unconscious world of symbols, the unconscious lives of images, and to collective experiences which is why a book of fairy tales or myths is indeed also occasionally used in therapeutic work. At the same time, however, it is about an understanding, a rational integration of this image world. The fascist temptation ultimately lies in regressive intoxication and enchantment, a relapse into an archaic world of symbols and effectual states, which beyond even the rational ethics of the world religions denounces enlightenment and rationality completely. One need only think of the occultism and the symbol-obsessed world of totalitarian regimes, like the National Socialist in Germany, which of course was combined with the highest degree of technical rationality. The murder factory of the National Socialist served a completely archaic madness that became utterly unhinged, and yet did so with logistical perfection. In the end, the tension between myth and enlightenment cannot be fully resolved. The complete repression of the world of symbols and the supposedly irrational 
does not lead to its disappearance, but rather to disassociation, which is perhaps a quite apt description of our current relationship to ourselves. This, on the one hand, defined by a psychology and a way of thinking in which we apply the sterile language of the machine world to describe ourselves, as if mental experience were accessible with the same functional terms used to operate a computer, such as, for example, many of the places where psychology research takes place at universities and the recruitment of personnel or the like. While on the other hand, beyond university and professional life, a psychology runs rampant, promising answers to life's questions where rationalist psychology remains silent, and which often enough drifts into bad esotericism and mere charlatanism. Both psychologies, as much as they are hostile to each other, and truth belong together and are the expression of a poorly integrated relationship to ourselves. A living psychology ultimately cannot get past the psychological need for symbols and must engage with its particularities. At the same time, for all forms of psychology that flirt too much with the irrational, one needs summon the words of the Austrian author and physician Otto Schnitzler. Entrance into the field of metaphysical problems should be permitted only to those minds that have proved themselves worthy of such permission through reputable conduct within the field of generally accessible realities. The study of occultism should be barred to anyone who within the relative obvious reality is not sufficiently knowledgeable. One could also say heart and head must come together so that mature thinking can become possible. This podcast is written and produced by Cecile Lutz and Jakob Müller. Translated and read by Solomon Lawrence.